We'll just give a few seconds more for people to join. Oh. We have about 74 people now. So just wait for another few seconds. Mani, we can start. I think we have a decent number now, 114. All right. Okay. Thanks, Neeraja. Um, good afternoon to all the participants of this webinar and the esteemed panelists. This is Barney Arol. I'm the president of HICIA. Um, the focus of the webinar titled uh, Navigating Omicron and Protecting Our Youngsters will be to understand the new variant of COVID virus, Omicron. How different it is from the previous variants and the changes in treatment and all home isolation protocols, all that stuff, right, could be deliberated today. Questions about booster doses and vaccinations for youngsters are also a kind of uh, a question that is uh, it's, it's a kind of you know, apprehension many people have as well. So we will also bring up that topic and deliberate on all those uh, different items. Uh, I'm sure you all know that has done a lot of intervention during the wave one and wave two. And uh, in terms of, you know, like I said, doing the on-site assessment and making sure that we are providing all the relief activities on a timely manner. They've also helped uh, set up close to 300 ICU beds, right? Not only in Hyderabad, but across different parts of Telangana. So we take pride in saying that IT industry has definitely demonstrated the humanity in terms of uh, helping the society at the right time. So thanks everyone. And today we have with us uh, Dr. Pavan Kumar Reddy, um, Senior Consultant, Critical Care Medicine, Care Super Specialty Hospital and Transplant Center, Banjara Hills. Dr. Nalini Nagala, she's a Senior Consultant, Pulmonologist, Continental Hospital. She focuses on tuberculosis and respiratory diseases. Dr. Anjul Dayal um, is a Senior Consultant, Pediatric Intensivist, Continental Hospitals, Hyderabad. The session will be moderated by Manisha Sabu, AVP and Center Head, Pochwara Indoor Campus, Infosys Limited. Manisha also is the treasurer and CSR forum leader of ICR. Many thanks to all the doctors who have taken the time off your busy schedule and participating in this event today. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Over to Manisha. Thank you, Varni. Um, thank you, doctors, for uh, accepting to give your precious time to guide us, to tell us exactly from the expert's view, what, what is it that we are up against when we are entering into the third wave? We've heard it a lot from WhatsApp, but I want to hear it from you. What are the symptoms, Dr. Anjul? What are the symptoms of uh, wave three that we should look out for? All right. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Manisha. And uh, hi, uh, everybody. Yes, as she rightly said, um, we are in the third wave. Um, um, basically, I'm a pediatric intensivist, so I'll talk more of the uh, the uh, this, uh, the symptoms which occur in the children and the youngsters, and probably my other colleague, Dr. Nalli and Dr. Pern will be able to throw light more on the adults who uh, are affecting with this. Uh, two things I want to just make uh, clear before we uh, start the discussion of the third wave, that this is a third wave of the COVID disease. This third wave is not a third wave of Omicron, although that's going to be the 
the the one of the major uh, variants uh, the reason behind that is that we are hearing a lot about uh, omicron saying that it's a milder version of the virus and probably they don't cause a serious disease which is true to some uh, 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 this thing but i think uh, more important is that we have to be uh, be very careful this is the third wave of covid and we never know which way the virus can turn and uh, how it's going to behave as of now the symptoms that we are seeing is mostly of a high grade fever which is happening at sudden onset there is a lot of body pains and mostly a little bit of uh, uh, upper respiratory tract infections like a cold cough uh, uh, if the children are asthmatic those children develop a bit of wheeze although they don't develop that severe symptoms where they require a lot of oxygen what we have seen in the second wave we have not seen a very sick children as of now uh, although we have admitted quite a few of them most of them have a very high grade fever initially for 2 to 3 days and uh, develop this cold cough uh, those are the usual symptoms that we are seeing as of now uh, the, uh, as uh, uh, compared to the last wave what we have seen the gastrointestinal symptoms like a lot of vomiting and loose motions we are not seeing as of now in the third wave so these are the things that we are uh, typically seeing in the children i think uh, dr nalini or pawan will be able to you know, throw light on uh, the the adult symptoms Dr. Nalini, uh, can you please add? Uh... Sure. Um, thank you very much, Aisha, for again inviting us for this um, uh, session. So, what I would like to add is that rather than whether symptoms are mild or more, what we need to focus is what is the risk for deterioration. I think that is the most important thing because if we have a 65-year-old man who has a heart disease, hypertension, diabetes. and if he has mild fever or cough also i would be worried and i would like to monitor this patient and see that it doesn't progress from mild to moderate or severe so that is how i would look at omicron so in the viral phase the symptoms will be mild as anjul pointed out body aches fever what they call it scratchy throat okay and uh, that sometimes diarrhea we are rarely seeing so these are all mild symptoms like for any viral infection however if a patient has health problems like um hypertension diabetes heart disease kidney disease cancer something like that or a patient is obese now obesity is considered a disease just not a you know uh, a lifestyle problem so if a patient is obese that is a very significant risk factor for severe covid or if it is pregnancy or immediately after pregnancy these people even if mild symptoms they have to be careful and they have to approach the doctor rest of the people just get tested stay at home and uh, just take paracetamol hydration and then monitor yourself and isolation for one week but even with mild symptoms these risk groups they have to approach the doctors because the first five days of treatment uh, is very first five days of symptoms onset is very important so that in these people we can prevent with certain medicines progression to moderate or severe disease so that is what i want uh, everybody to focus on the golden period in high risk group is first five days from symptoms onset so uh, sometimes what i'm hearing uh, from many people is even when the patient is tested first time around rt pcr using rt pcr uh, or sometimes even the uh, the rat uh, it comes negative and then again after reverse you do it comes positive is there something like that you also observe what is your experience in so terms of testing is, and so the thing is the timing for each test is very important now for for delta if you test within first 3 days the chances of coming negative are higher so that is why they said test on third day or fourth day it all depends upon the viral load that is present in the upper respiratory tract when we test just a see the trend is you get exposed to somebody or you go to a party or you go to vacation next day you want to get tested and you want that assurance that yes, it is negative and then you um, interact with everybody and all that then after 3 4 days then you turn positive so the timing is very important and usually third day is what we do but for omicron the another important thing is even a brief contact is enough not a prolonged contact like other variants and the incubation period is also very short usually within first 3 days or even within 24 hours they can develop symptoms and uh, rapid antigen tests are the sensitivity is less so you can miss the positivity Uh, so when you are exposed, or when you have a doubt, or when you have symptoms, always isolate yourself. 
when symptoms are there even if the test is negative don't be under false assurance that you do not have covid retest okay. again after 3 days that extremely important. important points dr nanini i'm so glad that you are making it like very very clear that don't just wait for the testing don't just say that okay i did testing and i'm negative so i don't need to worry and i can just behave normally that's one important point the second point i heard is that is very rapidly spreading so you have to be very careful also the virus viral load is little low or so it's important that we understand that aspect also and take appropriate precaution uh, my next question is for dr pavan uh, sir is there anything that we can do as a preventive measure because sometimes i hear people saying now this omicron na doesn't matter whether you sanitize or not uh, your hands you don't need to worry just wear double mask that's enough so can you give me actual expert opinion uh see the basic thing is uh, like anjul said don't think that it is all omicron uh think of it like any other covid because what we uh, when we look at it, the number of tests that we do specific tests we are seeing that there is a mixture of delta and omicron both going on it is just not omicron has suddenly come up and it has taken over we have seen delta uh, variants also go up. so you have to treat it like any other covid but uh, like basically uh, any other flu it is basically transmitted more from person to person rather than from fomite fomite in the sense we say somebody has sneezed somewhere and you are touching those uh, i mean surfaces such as a table or a door knob or a lift button the chances of picking it from the fomite that is from surfaces uh, is lesser it the higher chance is from directly getting exposed to somebody with that virus in a higher load uh, in their respiratory secretion so maybe sneezing maybe coughing somebody has got that and omicron has got a the variant has got a little higher propensity to transmit faster because probably majority of the virus is actually getting loaded in the upper respiratory tract so in that sense uh, it is from person to person that is the reason why uh, newer evidence wise they are saying that it is probably from a person to person transmission is higher then actually picking up from some place so more important it is important to wear a mask both the person who has the symptoms and person who is not having symptoms one is not to give it to the others one is to not to take it from the others yes. so it is important that way that mask is the only thing that is going to prevent hand washing hand rubbing sanitizing all those are other additional measures but social distancing Uh, these will help you a little bit but major problem will be that you are exposure directly to a person who has got the infection so coming to the symptoms part like you said morely what we are seeing in now with those with omicron or whatever there is wave what we are seeing is patients who have a lot of malaise that is uh, myalgias there is muscle aches back aches and headache headache is something if you have a headache Uh, and you have got a lot of weakness kind of tiredness kind fatigue kind of symptoms then you think that you get covid you have covid so uh, that is something um, that just repeating it a uh, severe body ache and uh, a headache fisha and uh, back ache so headache and uh, regular cold cough people will have a doubt but one more predominantly we are seeing is weakness you will feel lot tired and weak to begin with before the actual fever starts so once you are feeling feeling a uh, lot of weakness or if you are starting to have headache then think that it might be covid and it, it is be better and, and the you kind of isolate is yourself isolate, isolate yourself, yourself. Isolate. especially if you have elders at home definitely mm. isolate yourself without just saying i'll test and then i'll yes take. yes and and if you can i can i add one point here yes sir uh, yes sir see uh, uh, what we are seeing of now uh, uh, unlike the second wave where one or two people were getting affected what we have seen now is in this wave is that the entire family is getting affected uh, four or five family members together will get affected as dr pawan was saying because of the probably very high transmissibility of the virus but there is another thing where uh, what we have seen the trend is that when the uh, they get exposed say they go out somewhere and one or two family members gets a fever usually the parents will go and get themselves tested and if they are negative they say everybody is negative but it doesn't happen like that uh, there can be a, a situations and we have seen those situations where the parents are negative but the children are positive so in case if they are exposed as a group it is important that everybody gets tested 
the the importance there is because in the case the kids are getting affected uh, and the grandparents are there at home and the kids are not uh, isolated from them those are the uh, high risk people who might develop a severe disease so it's very important when you're testing that you test as an entire group and whoever has got exposed everybody should go and get uh, tested as dr nalini said the sensitivity of the test might be less but it might come as one person positive other person negative so in case if two are negative and rest are not tested it's better to test all of them so that you know if, if one person is positive in the group then take as the entire group being positive and isolate everybody manisha can yes, i just add something uh, yes please yes please doctor yeah so the question is uh, um, what precautions i think uh, in the mind of many people there is why precautions <laughs> if omicron is mild why take the precautions i am sure it is there in everybody's mind it is yes. there in the minds of my family members who might try to convince every time kid no it is very important why it is important is because this wave has come not like a small wave it has come like a tsunami otherwise why will we have so many infections per day doubling up almost i think 1.9 lakh new cases today in india and the majority will be omicron only what might be the uh, i mean the, uh, the official numbers might be something different but uh, it is uh, mostly omicron only that shows how rapidly it is transmitting in the society so when does a virus undergo mutation when it is rapidly spreading in the society when the viral load is very high these are the times when a virus can mutate so we are in a very vulnerable period though it is in a milder form now it can just a few important mutations can turn it into a more deadlier virus than delta so really? there is yes when there is a rapid transmission there is always a chance of mutation so all of us have to be responsible and the way we change the course of this disease in our, is in our hands now so if we are careful only for the next two months so let us keep a target two months maybe after that we will do another hysia session and say whether we are out of risk or still another target but right now the target is two months so um, and as dr pavan said yes mask first we are looking at the vaccines initially the protection with two doses of vaccines is excellent now we say after two doses now it, the efficacy for omicron is reducing to 50% so we have to take a booster is booster enough no the efficacy is increasing only to 70% so we are use we are saying mask is also very important mask when we use a clo cloth mask the person who is having a disease will not spread to others okay but he might still a person who doesn't have a disease can still get infection with a cloth cloth mask the way omicron is spreading so we have to wear either a three layered mask or an n95 mask if we really want to prevent like you are, you are saying that it's very important it's very important to move forward and do our work for that we have to protect ourselves well a person who is coughing having symptoms if he wears a cloth mask that is enough he won't spread the disease to others but a person who is normal who doesn't have covid if they just wear a cloth mask in ac atmosphere in an it office that might not be sufficient so that point is important thirdly whatever we do we have to avoid social gatherings marriages new years parties christmas parties all these things we all must have done that this is the need of the hour okay we had less cases so we relaxed but now we know that we are in the wave whatever we do vaccination booster vaccine masking all this is okay very important but distancing is very important and uh, avoiding gatherings going to movies theaters and uh, uh, social gatherings and Or, travel madam sorry travel 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 Maybe people ask about travel See, travel depends. If you are going to drive in your own vehicle or mask yourself and go for job purpose, yes. Vacation can't be postponed for two months, two more months. Yes, <laughs> so important things least. have to be done. All together will work in controlling this wave. Not in a dis disjointed way, not in a dispassionate way. We have to uh, do this with a controlled, disciplined approach. Thank you, uh, Doctor Anjul. My question uh, is for you, where we. want to know about what are the medicines that we should keep handy what are the precautions that we can take like you know preparedness to deal with the uh, virus and uh, is there anything like what we saw in the second wave the um, the stronger medicines left side effects right so what is it that you we should be careful about when it comes to third wave see um, uh, it's a very good question uh, uh, manisha uh, two things you know the first and second wave of the virus has uh, taught us a few very strong lessons one that 
whenever a wave comes along with the wave there is a wave of medicines which also comes up behind that wave saying that this medicine a new medicine which is now more helpful and the people start buying and stocking those medicines and after the wave goes away then the studies start coming that those medicines were not at all helpful we have gone through so many medicines there and we all know about that uh, i think the uh, as we are seeing the third wave as of now it's mostly the milder symptoms and as uh, pawan very rightly pointed out that the fever with headache the throat pain and uh, a cold and cough and uh, uh, these are the milder symptoms which occur so i think the regular medications which we get that the fever medicine the uh, the medicine for the cold and cough uh, should be available at home uh, those are the medicines that we should keep we should not be running behind using very strong medicines which is not really helpful over here uh, please uh, try to uh, not go to the uh, pharmacy shop and saying that we have seen lot of people going there and buying a bunch of um, multiple antibiotics antivirals which they were giving as a package saying that uh, take these medicines for 5 days or 6 days multiple medications over there that's not required i think the symptomatic treatment the medicines what is required is important apart from that in case if you require any other medicine as far as the antiviral medication or any other injectable medication is concerned i think it's always better to go and talk to your healthcare provider who will be able to guide you if you require or not the stronger the medicines the stronger the side effects we don't know really if those medicines are helpful or not but we definitely know that their uh, side effects are there to stay with you for a long time so i think try to use only the symptomatic treatment and rest of it take the medicines with the guidance of your healthcare provider thank you no dr nalini dr uh, uh, pavan do you want to add to this yeah. pavan would you like to add first then i will yeah so like dr anjal said it's basically majority of the time see uh, in indian population youngsters are demographically the major part under 30 population we have a significant amount of population <laughs> and we are not expecting many of them to fall in we are not like in europe where the elderly population is of significant demographic in the country so we will see a lot of uh, patients getting a lot of people getting positive i think uh, we all will get ultimately every 50% they are saying wh is saying 50% of europe will get omicron in india it will be more because of the overcrowding that we have in india so my probably 75% of the population will turn positive at some point whether you know it or whether you test it if you test it you are positive if you don't test it you will be negative so in that sense we are all going to go through this so the point to basically to understand is not to panic it is majority of the time it is going to be a milder infection you may have a fever you may have a headache you may have a severe body pain for 3 to 5 days and then it will settle only biggest problem is those who are at risk for them there might be a problem so that is the basic issue so not everybody should run around and take there will there are no medications that will cater to 75% of the population to consume even paracetamol you won't have that much uh, in the country if 75% of the population falls sick within a span of 1 to 2 months so the point is that we should not be running behind uh, uh, some exorbitant costly medicines or medications that are of half deck uh, proof Twice. So basically, you stick to like your how you treat your regular cold and cough, unless if you are symptoms persist beyond five days, beyond the third day, beyond the fifth day, if you are still having high grade fever, that's when you go consult your doctor and then take uh, what else the for individual basis based on your symptoms, your severity of symptoms, uh, you will be prescribed treatment which might be different for different patients. So it all depends on the risk profile of the patient. depends on the severity of the symptoms their persistence of symptoms without not coming down then your doctor will take care of it and then advise you some treatment so you should not be running behind because we see that when everybody gets infected in that situation people start to hoard medications which has happened in second wave when we had a really tough time for those actually who really needed needed so we would we wouldn't suggest that kind of a situation and we are not expecting that kind of situation here also but the question is that since majority of the time it is going to be mild even even regular covid that was what happens is like 90% i mean 80% of them will have a mild fever only 20% of them get hospitalized the problem between delta and the omicron variant we are having in this wave the second wave and third wave is if 100 people had an infection 
with the Delta wave. 20 of them would have got admitted in the hospital. Now, only 5% or 4% might get admitted. But the problem here is it's not 100 number. This is a 1,000 number. So 5% of 1,000 is still 50. So that's the biggest problem. That's a very interesting point that you've brought in, where we say that, okay, it's only 1%, 2%, 5%, but since the spread is so much, that 5% is also equal to wave 2. So the biggest problem at this point of time is that the way it is spreading, it will spread a lot of people, to a lot of people. Especially it is very important why we are telling everybody to be cautious about this. We don't want people to get admitted to hospitals or the precautionary measures. There are there may be still risky population, population who have elderly, who have diabetes, hypertension, but even for a low-grade fever, we don't want you running and rushing and be admitting it. And the biggest problem is healthcare staff. Now we have tried, averted ourselves from getting any infection. None of my hospital staff got infection in the first and second wave because we were very diligent in that. Now what you will see is even healthcare staff, nurses, doctors, everybody is going to get infected. The biggest problem is the number of patients who are going to come in, number of uh, infections in the society that are going to increase, the number of healthcare staff are also going to go down. The biggest problem is those who actually require medical therapy they will suddenly see that there is a healthcare shortage. You will see nurses on isolation for seven days. Doctors may not be there. You know, uh, uh, those who may need emergency surgery, those who need emergency care for some other reasons, they will have a bigger problem because the whole healthcare system gets overburdened and the healthcare staff is not there to actually take care. That is a significant event to why people are worried about, even if it's a mild way, even if it's a mild case, let's say 99% of them are mild, 1%. Let's say every day you have one and a half, 1.9 lakh. In US, you are seeing 10 lakh new cases every day. New cases, that's not the total. That's a new cases per day. So that's the amount. Even if it's a mild flu, headache, unfortunately, if you are a healthcare person, you have to be out of, let's say, police people, traffic constables, they're out. And you are working with 50% staff. Just imagine what's going to be. So it's like something like in a company, let's say a software company is there, and 50% of the staff are not coming. Uh, majority of the projects get postponed. So we are talking about the same side of situation in a more emergent uh, um, staff and the emergency staff uh, are required on a day to get because you can't afford to have 50% of them at home, not at work. Yeah, uh, yes, um, uh, we have to be responsible citizen and uh, avoid stepping out unless it's essential because there's overall burden on the system that you're stepping out will mean. Um, um, Madam, you wanted to add? Yeah. So I think they have all uh, covered it very well. And one thing I would like to say is that, yes, majority don't require treatment, just a symptomatic treatment. But as I mentioned, in the high risk group, there are certain drugs available. Um, now, I think uh, majority, I think when they ask for drugs, they have in the mind about this monopiravir drug, which is available now. Uh, being distributed by many companies, monopiravir. This is not for people with no risk, please understand that molnupiravir is only for high risk groups who is extremely obese or who has got health problems under medical supervision only. It has to be prescribed over the counter. It should not be taken because this has got a teratogenicity. That means if a person is in the childbearing age, if unprotected sex is practiced while taking the tablet, even three months after breastfeeding, pregnancy, this drug should not be taken. So absolutely a no-no without medical prescription. This is available in tablet form, so it it might be it, it might be very tempting to take this drug from you know if so you know it's from some pharmacy guy you might be able to get without a prescription sometimes, but it's very dangerous like that under monitoring in a specific population it is supposed to reduce the risk of hospitalization and death by thirty percent. Now the remdesivir injection which we talked about so much has come back again. Now there is a new trial which has showed that three days of remdesivir in injection in the high risk group can reduce the risk of hospitalization and death by 87%. The cocktail which everybody is asking for, uh, it is actually being overused to be very frank. All everybody without risk factors also are taking which was valid during Delta wave. But for Omicron, I think it is little, we are overusing it. And studies have clearly shown when they studied in the lab that this Omicron, uh, against Omicron, this antibody cocktail is not very effective. 
So why are we spending uh, 60,000 rupees on a uh, cocktail, which is not very effective against Omicron? So please don't ask for uh, antibody cocktail. Let us decide if we still feel that, you know, during this overlap period, wherein both Delta and Omicron are there in high risk group, we might decide to give cocktail, but not for everybody. Yes, uh, like uh, uh, you were saying that, please don't go to doctor saying, I need this. Let the doctor decide. So, don't so, come with preconceived prescription, then it gets very <laughs> difficult to convince. Yes. Um, Madam, how is the impact uh, on the pregnant woman? Mm. Now, anything that uh, you would like to specifically mention? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, most of the trials, the studies, when they do, they remove the pregnant, lactating, uh, breastfeeding woman out of it. So it is very difficult to know what uh, these vaccines or this disease does on the pregnancy. Though the overall risk is uh, low, still pregnancy is a risk factor. Not only pregnancy, first one, two months after pregnancy is also a risk factor for a severe COVID. We have seen during Delta or even during the first wave, people in advanced pregnancy coming re with respiratory failure, requiring mechanical ventilator, ICU care, and all these things. But majority did well with good care. There is also a chance of uh, preterm births with uh, COVID infection in pregnancy. And also there could be associated pregnancy-related complications. So I feel the most important, in the UK, surprisingly, the data shows that 75% and in US, 65% of pregnant women are unvaccinated. Can you believe it? Okay, so because there is a lot of confusion and there is no clear verdict till now, uh, till recently, that whether when they should whether they should get vaccinated or not, if they can get vaccinated, when they should get vaccinated, is it in the first trimester or later on? So so much of confusion. So if the authorities are themselves in confusion because it's a new thing, then naturally people tend to avoid vaccination. You know, normal people are avoiding vaccination. We are seeing that. So in pregnancy, it's but natural to avoid vaccination. Absolutely. So we have seen that most of the uh, complications are in unvaccinated pregnant women. So in vaccinated pregnant women, the risk is much, much lower. And the same, I feel, applies to Omicron also. Because we don't have much data now about Omicron in pregnancy. Thank you. Uh, why don't I take some questions from the chat box? Uh, Sayed has asked that many people are saying that the RT-PCR test, Omicron is not recognizing. Uh, so basically, RT-PCR test is not recognizing Omicron. Is it true? I think we took it initially, but if you don't mind, do you want to give a quick answer to this? See, the basic thing is that uh, it is of not much important for the general public to understand whether it is Omicron or Delta. So when you do an RT-PCR, it picks up COVID. Okay. So COVID is positive, RT-PCR is positive. Normally when we do RT-PCR routinely, earlier we used to do three genes, then we went back to just picking up two genes because it decreases the cost of the RT-PCR. So all labs have been doing two gene or one gene, which picks up. Uh, of the three genes, there is something called SG. Now S gene is something uh, which is against which uh, the vaccines are made. So COVID shield, what we are taking, or the Pfizer vaccine, these are basically against those S gene. So these vaccines act against the S gene. So the basic problem, what is happening, that gene is being detected uh, majorly earlier. Now we have stopped doing that. We are only doing the other two genes. And uh, when you do for any COVID, those two should be positive. But in Omicron, there are a lot of mutations, especially on that S gene particle. So when you do an RT-PCR with all three genes, uh, if your S is dropped, which is called the S gene failure detection method, so in the sense, if the S is not seen, if the G S gene is not seen, but the other two genes are seen, then they started looking at it. Probably it is an Omicron variant because there is S is not seen. Otherwise you would see all three in the Delta or the earlier variants. So in Omicron, you're not seeing the S. -wave. So that is the only uh, confusion which uh, a lay person would not understand because they will see something on the WhatsApp, something on the newspaper. So some people earlier, some governments have used it as a screening method, like Maharashtra government did a three gene assay for everybody whom they tested. And if the S gene is not picked up, that is, there is no S gene not detected, but other two genes are detected, then they would do for further analysis to confirm whether it's Omicron or not. The bigger problem now comes is that there are different, again, Omicron is again mutating into two different sublineages and stuff. And then so 
BA1 and BA2. BA1, again, the S gene is not seen. BA2, again, S gene is seen. So even if a micron uh, BA2 variant, you will see the S gene, which is something like delta. So there is not much of a difference in picking up. Now, early on in the wave, people wanted those, especially when the cocktail antibody cocktail is an expensive therapy for the high-risk patients. When they wanted to give it, they would do this usually the three gene assay so that to differentiate whether it is delta or omicron because uh, the monoclonal antibody that is the antibody cocktail will not work for omicron. It may only work for uh, delta variant. So if there are a high risk patient and if the patient is required or if is not vaccinated and if somebody in, the, in his family or in a bloodline had a severe COVID, there might be a possibility that uh, for them not to progress further on, you may offer a monoclonal antibody if it is delta. So they wanted to do these kind of tests. So it is all up to the doctors to decide on whether it is needed to do all three genes or not. But for a routine PCR, it will pick up whether it is Omicron, Delta, Beta, Alpha, whatever variant it is, the regular artificial will pick up. That is a bottom line. Thank you. I'm going to the next question, which Venkat has asked, that for kids, uh, so Dr. Anjul, since it is for children, uh, for kids, if we suspect that they had uh, fever due to COVID that subsided um, uh, on the second day, about a month ago, what precaution we should take and what should we look for, look out for as of now? Kids do not have any symptom uh, and are quite active. Okay, so uh, uh, what I understand from there is that a kid had a fever probably a month back or a week back and now the child is doing okay. So uh, see, even uh, two things to remember for the children who get affected from COVID in, in, uh, who are less than 15 years of age, until unless they have some high risk in them, like Dr. Nalli very rightly pointed out initially that obesity is one of the very important risk factor. So if the child is not obese, he doesn't have any underlying heart, lung or kidney or liver disease, then usually they will have a very milder disease or mostly they will be asymptomatic. So in case if the child had a fever, either it's a COVID or non-COVID Omicron or any other form of COVID, and they have become asymptomatic and afebrile now after a period of seven days, they are safe. We don't really require any long-term medications for those children. Uh, only thing is during that period, in case if they got the fever initially, the first seven days or till 10 days, they are infected and they can infect others, especially the elders in the family who will uh, uh, land up into the high risk category uh, people. So for the children, the precautions will be to isolate them. One of the parents who is not uh, uh, affected can still stay with the children if they are smaller. If they are bigger children, adolescent, they can stay on their own in an isolated room inside the house and uh, uh, they can be taken care of. If the entire family is affected or there's a child who's very small, then a parent who's taking care of the child should take care of using the uh, sanitization properly, the hand sanitization and wearing the mask when they're taking care of the child. If it's a newborn or a, a infant which is affected, then probably the, the mother who's nursing can, can wear the mask uh, and to take a proper hand hygiene before giving the uh, feeding to the child if she's uh, breastfeeding the child. So those are the precautions that you require for the children as such. Thank you. That was very helpful. Uh, next question is come from Kartika, who is, uh, whose question is, if, for example, there's a person who has come in contact with someone who is tested positive. So this person should um, go in for testing directly or first isolate and uh, then look out for symptoms. And if there are symptoms, then go out for, go for testing. You got that, right? Directly go for testing yes. or wait for symptoms and then go for testing. I think Dr. Nalli has already answered, but I think yes. Dr. Nalli, he can just give another comment on it. Okay. So basically, uh, you come to work, don't stay at work. <laughs> wear mask, <laughs> come to work because you, you have not yet become a patient. So uh, only thing is protect people around you, wear a mask. So if the exposure is for a long period, you know that you know without mask, both of you have sp send, spent time more than 20 minutes, which is again a high risk factor. Then get yourself tested on fourth day or fifth day. If it is a very transient contact, no symptoms, just one week, just wear mask and uh, be careful. That's all. But if symptoms are there, definitely get tested. If no symptoms, 
and uh, exposure is there continue wearing mask continue to work and do your routine activities and get tested on 4th or 5th day thank you this is very clear and thank you for uh, repeating your response but it was very important for everyone i thought let me hear it again um this is an interesting question which is on everybody's mind that what are the chances of reinfection and what is the data suggesting? Some people say you won't get reinfected before nine months. Somebody says, no, no, it's six months. Somebody says, no, there's nothing like that. You can re get reinfected any time. See, basically, um, Omicron is specifically interesting in that front that because yes, you can see reinfections here. So you can get infected. Uh, see, infection in the sense, what was happening was uh, you will get infected like a cold. So you are telling me that you may have one cold, you will not have the cold with the same virus in the next three months. It all depends on how the body's local antibodies are there within your nose. There are different types of antibodies, one in the blood, one in the nasal mucosa. So these antibodies uh, are not long lived. They are for a short time. So the infection, as long as it is to the upper respiratory tract, infection, you may get it again and again. So that means the chance of reinfection. As long as you don't have symptoms, uh, you don't need to worry. But if you're having symptoms again and again, you need to understand that you might be getting reinfected. We have seen patients who have got infected in the first wave and the second wave now coming back with the milder form of the infection. So it will cause reinfection. It can cause reinfection. There is nothing that reinfection is an issue. Even with vaccines or boosters or whatsoever, people will have that uh, wrong notion that vaccines should be 100% effective and they should not cause you infection. Even if you're infected, even if you're vaccinated, double booster or 10 boosters, you may still get infected. The, the major aim of vaccine is to prevent severity. It, it decreases severity. None of the vaccines for any cold, flu uh, or something are not 100%. Even for influenza, it is only 15 to 30% effective. There are some, such as polio vaccine, they are really good. Some for hepatitis A, they're really good. Once you give it the lifetime immunity you get from the vaccines. Not all vaccines are like that. Each vaccine will have a different efficacy. And depending upon how immunogenic and antibody response, they will be different. Though those viruses, which are basically like common cold and flu, that's why you don't have any vaccine for a common cold. Because uh, that is also caused by coronavirus. 30 percent of the common cold are caused by uh, regular corona, other coronas. But then uh, you see that is what is important. So vaccines will uh, prevent severity. They are not there to prevent infection. It is not that you take a booster and then you can throw your mask away and go around. So uh, vaccines will decrease the severity, the chances of you getting sick and get hospitalized. But then uh, that is it. So reinfection is possible. Even if you are boosted, even if you are vaccinated, you may get an infection and uh, you probably will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Um, there's another question which is related to how long after recovering from the infection is someone eligible for a booster dose? Eligible not necessarily in the government term, eligible in terms of medical. So basically, that's what we say. If you have got an infection, basically you already have the antibodies start to be produced within the body. And the idea for giving a vaccine is that you produce an antibody for that. So our aim of giving, or the government's aim of giving uh, uh, vaccines to those who have already got infected is basically to cover them up for further infection or to prevent reinfection. The idea is to decrease the severity if they get reinfected again. So, uh, but we know that vaccines are not going, boosters are not going to decrease your chances of infection. It's only to decrease your severity the second time around. So we're trying to give it. But ideally speaking, yeah, if you think that at least uh, three months or six months, you may have some antibody, some sort of a protection from going into a severe disease process. So at least like any other vaccine, once you take a vaccine, the booster is required only after nine months or 10 months. So the same way, if you have an infection, um, possibly, it will up to six to nine months. You may not need the vaccine, but the government wanted everybody to get the vaccine. So it prescribed a time span of at least a month. Don't take it before one month, but after one month, you can take it any point of time. So that's what the government regulation says. Uh, is this also the same for youngsters? Say, for example, a youngster who has not got any vaccine and now um, is, in, uh, is in touch with the people who have tested positive. 
So how, you know, can, the, can we just take the youngster to hospital and get the vaccination done or we wait? We understand whether uh, the youngster also is infected by any chance and then decide on vaccination? See, uh, basically you have to understand if there are chances of you having the virus and transmitting it to other people is less. If you have symptoms, definitely, generally, we say an infection. Infection doesn't mean uh, having the virus just in the nose when you do an RT-PCR without any symptoms. When we say infection, we are talking about somebody having symptoms. That is called an infection. Just having the viral particles within the nostril, we will not call them as an infection. You may be positive in RT-PCR because everybody else in the house has got positive. You may have one fragment of a dead virus somewhere. RT-PCR, unfortunately, is a very sensitive test, so it will pick up even dead virus. So we don't know whether it is a multiplying virus, whether it's an active virus. That's why there is a number called uh, the CT value which they give in the report, which tells you if it is high, definitely we know that there is a multiplying virus. If it is it's a very 30 or 35, that means we don't know that the load is very little. Okay. Uh, I think uh, yeah. I'm so, just... Yeah, uh, Pawan, I think what uh, uh, the question was implied was in case if somebody has come in contact with somebody with a suspected COVID, can they go uh, for the vaccine or we have to wait? So I think the answer for that will be in case if I'm caught in contact with somebody who's having a COVID, even if I'm asymptomatic, probably I should wait at least for a period of uh, a week to 10 days to see if I'm developing the symptoms or not and then go for the vaccination. Vaccination is important. Let's not have a doubt about the efficacy of the vaccine, which is rightly pointed out by Pawan that vaccine prevents the severity of the disease, not the transmission or getting the disease. But in case if we have come in contact with somebody who was having COVID, probably wait for at least two weeks before you take the vaccine. If you are asymptomatic, go ahead and take the vaccine. Uh, Nalli, you want to... One more thing I wanted you to add is... Uh... Um, if the child gets COVID, like for example, child received the first dose of COVID vaccine, then later the child develops COVID infection. Do you recommend a second dose again or do you consider this infection as the second dose? All right. Okay. That's a good question. See, I mean, uh, the COVID vaccination for the children, if you see, has started just now. So probably we will be able to come to this scenario uh, uh, six months down the line or uh, later, uh, at least uh, two to three months later. But uh, there are two thoughts about it. Uh, a natural infection can give you immunity, which might give you a broad spectrum T helper cells, which will help. And uh, the second thing is we have seen the people who have gone through two vaccinations still getting it. So probably this meant the second dose, if you delay it a little bit as three months or six months from the, uh, the infection, and then it will act as a boosting effect. I think I will err on the side of a caution. And in case if the, a child has taken a vaccine first dose after that before the second dose he has gotten a natural infection with the covid probably wait for another uh, uh, three months six months and then take at least six months and, and take the second dose yes. don't don't stop taking the second dose makes sense logically also because uh, when we are dealing with a different variant like for delta when somebody is infected with delta then omicron has got a complete immune escape there is a, what we call it a hybrid immunity is because of vaccine and also because of previous infection. Unfortunately for Omicron, both are low. So even if you are vaccinated, the efficacy is less with Omicron as compared to all other variants across the same with previous infections also. So when we are infected with the same variant, there might be some protection. Uh, so if you, when Omicron takes over everything and if somebody is infected with Omicron, it is like vaccination only. And particularly for children, I think it is better to wait another six months and consider the next one as a booster. That's great. Um, the other question, the next question comes from Sunita Patel. Uh, her question is, me, my husband and my son got Omicron recently and discharged yesterday. My parents tested negative three days back and still no symptoms for them. Should I make them repeat antigen test again or be assured that since they did not get any symptoms, they are not COVID positive? So basically, um, depend if they're the family members, at least five days or six days is the incubation period. Yeah. So at the, if no symptoms, at the end of that incubation period, they can get themselves tested. Uh, you you, uh, you uh, suggest that they get tested at the, uh, after elderly, six days? Elderly are the high-risk group. So at the end of five days, they can get tested. 
Okay. Um, uh, a, a simple question maybe for you, but it is coming to my mind again and again when I'm listening to you is that in the first wave, we heard a lot about asymptomatic uh, infection, right? Mm -hmm. So in this wave, how is it? Do we still have Omicron also asymptomatic? Yes. Are you seeing lots of asymptomatic? So it is too early to, for, to say, but uh, from the data from South Africa, clear and from UK clearly say that these infections can be mild and asymptomatic people and vaccinated people without any symptoms can transmit the disease. Okay, so even in Omicron, we have asymptomatic. More so from the data. Okay. Um, now, uh, Kartika Nair has another question that is, Doctor, can you also touch some uh, touch upon some points on kids? Uh, as the kids below 15 are still not vaccinated and they were being asked to come to school. So any opinion around uh, children going to school and especially when they're not vaccinated? Okay, I see uh, uh, it's, it's a it cash 22 situation, right? So um, you don't send the kids to the, how long you don't send the kids to school and how long you are keeping your life on home. So uh, uh, and there is no guidelines as such, if you see, uh, which is going to actually help you. What we can say is whenever there's a sudden wave or surge of the cases which are coming in, probably that is the time when the kids should stay at home. They should not be going to the school. As, as Nalini said, school is a bigger thing. They should not be going to the party. They should not be going to a mall or uh, restaurants or where, wherever there is going to be a crowd of the people. Uh, once the wave goes uh, goes down, then the children less than 15 years of age, probably, yes, I think they can go to school, uh, provided uh, the area and uh, the, the school is uh, following all the safety precautions and there is no surge in the cases. But I think the caution, I will always tell the, the, the school that the, the, the onus lies both on the parents and the, the school to see that the other children who are coming to the school don't get infected. So probably a triaging of the, uh, the, the children at the school entrance is also very important with the, uh, uh, this thing telling to the parents that in case if we find your child is having some symptoms, they should be sent back uh, home. So probably once this pandemic is over and we are expecting this wave should not be uh, very long probably by feb we, uh, by the end of uh, march we might see the, um, the the wave going down then probably we can yes allow the kids to go to school till that time yes absolutely no school as nandi said let's take two months at a time so i think that's what uh, should be the oh, month by saying that she postponed my vacation <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there's one uh, question, uh, Dr. Nalini, which was in some ways already responded to, but it will be great if you can respond specifically. My son is born on 14 December. My wife couldn't get her vaccination due to many confusions, as you mentioned uh, in your response in the, for the previous question. Can she take the vaccines now? And secondly, what are the precautions we can take at our home to protect the newborn? Because it's a small baby and there's so much talk about Omicron. I'm sure it's very scary. So yes, definitely she can get vaccinated now. Uh, in fact, it is recommended now during pregnancy also. There's definitely, there is no problem. So another thing for the newborns is, newborn is not going to go out and get exposed. It, it is the family members who are going to pass on infection. So again, the same thing, COVID appropriate behavior. That means in the new normal situation, not like the first way where there was a complete lockdown. Now we need to protect our economy. We need to move forward. So we need to do what is required. Go, we have to go to the office, take all the precautions, see that exposure is not there. Please do not eat together during this wave. Uh, those precautions, if those family members can take, that is great. Uh, and then come back uh, um, and then take care of your newborn. So basically people going out and uh, uh, not properly following COVID appropriate behavior is the one which gives the risk to the newborn. Since uh, and we are seeing some infections in newborns also, Dr. Anjul would. Uh, um, I have seen recently read some reports also of newborns coming with fevers and all those things, which is very worrying. So I think COVID appropriate behavior and booster vaccination to the family members. If six months are over, don't wait for nine months. If six months are over, then please take a booster vaccination because you have a high risk uh, baby at home. 
Or is and, it allowed uh, by the government norms? I thought government says that only above 60 years. That yeah, yeah. see, big. that is when, when that's what Dr. Nalim Dinh said, when it is allowed. Not that okay. uh, you go around and six months take it. The other thing, uh, this regarding this infant, uh, I believe a mother is breastfeeding the baby because the baby is born in December. So yeah. breast milk will also transmit some antibodies to the baby. So please uh, take the vaccine. If you're not vaccinated, the mother should take the vaccine so that uh, she can give her antibodies to the baby through breastfeeding also. So the baby is double protected that way. Mother and baby both are protected that way. So the mother, if she's not vaccinated because of the confusion, now it's the right time. She can go and take the vaccine. So she will help the baby that way also. Um, Dr. Pawan, I've not asked you a question for a while. So now my next question is for you. <laughs> um, very interesting observation. The home testing kits are confusing. The control line is not turning pink, but only test line is pink, uh, turning pink. Any, any comments? Uh, there are a lot of uh, kits, though it is being ICMR approved, quality process has to be stringent. Uh, biggest problem is the stringent quality is not being there uh, when these tests coming up. So there will be a lot of problems with these kits. That's why we don't rely. It might be a screening test. If it is positive, yes, it is positive. But if you get these kind of uh, results, it is very difficult to interpret. So in that sense, you may have to go out and get your RT-PCR done for confirmation because these are these are less sensitive these are rapid antigen they're rapid for a reason you do it and within immediately you get a result so these are something that we may use in a hospital to screen whether this patient goes into a covid icu or a non-covid icu or a covid ward or a non-covid ward or cohort them in a place so these are specifically made for certain situations but because they're easy to do and fast uh, response and to decrease the burden on the RT-PCR labs. They are being advocated, given out in some uh, centers such as in the US and all that. Then some countries are very stringent about if you want to go out, you, find, you have to take an rt rapid antigen test and if it's negative, then only you venture out, such as in Singapore. So they've been using it as a screening test. It's just a screening test. Uh, it's not something that is basically as a confirmatory test. Yeah, but if it is a positive, yeah, it kind of, you can take it as a thing that yes, it is positive. But if it is, it's like any other test. If it's, if it's dubious, if it's doubtful, then there, it comes with a lot of caveats and how you're doing it. So in that sense, so yeah, if it is faulty, you may repeat it. Or if you think it's the same thing coming up with the next kit, you throw it out to go back and get an article. Yeah, if you are having some tips. Like for example, if you are going on a vacation, you have said vacation, 15, 20 people of you are going on a vacation or that, you know, you're trying to shoot a movie. They're trying to create a bubble there to screen that this test is good in people whom we are not suspecting COVID. But if you person who is having active COVID symptoms, it might not always be positive. So it helps in that rapid screening wherein you want to create a bubble where everybody is negative. This helps. Okay. Um, that that was uh, that was good information to know, especially because everybody is talking about the home testing, right? So this is very important for all of us to have clarity about. There's a question about um, uh, pregnant ladies. This is asked by Nitika. Uh, the question is for pregnant ladies to increase the immunity. Any suggestions, uh, uh, Doctor Nalini and Jewel, Doctor uh, any of you? So unfortunately, there, there are no immune boosters officially made. Whatever they are being projected are not actually immune boosters and they're not of help. So what we need is good nutrition, less stress, which, which are very nice to talk about, but difficult to practice. Uh, less stress, good nutrition, good sleep, taking care of our health every day. The process of uh, maintaining good health is the only thing and vaccinations on time, all vaccinations. Like if it's flu season, take a flu vaccine take COVID vaccines. And if there are any anything wrong, don't neglect um, thinking that it is pregnancy. Why, do, why should I get unnecessary tests done? Why should I go? I will be exposed to COVID and all that. But if something you will, your body will tell you, will give you warning signs that something is not right. And at that time you have to approach the doctor and take early treatment and prevent further progression. Yeah, if, um, if I may add over here, uh... Uh, remember, the pregnancy is a, a, a place where the female and the, the infant to be born both have to be protected. So probably 
isolation and a very stringent sanitation uh, uh, methods have to be followed a little bit more diligently um, uh, as uh, compared to the others, I think so. There's also a question about, um, uh, can we wash N95 masks with soap, water, and reuse? Not recommended. No. 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 It's only for cloth mask. Wash, washing is only for cloth mask. Like, no, no, no. So absolutely. Not, it is only for a reusable mask. N95 is not a reusable mask beyond one week or so. So, no. And uh, uh, a point here, when you throw N95 mask, please cut it and throw it. You know the implications. Nowadays, those th these things will be picked up from the rack pickers and then will be bleached and then resold again. So probably cut those N95 before you throw them. Uh, one question uh, from, um, uh, from Ramaya. Um, after taking two doses of COVID shield, can we take COVAXIN as a booster dose? You want the uh, evidence answer? You want what do you want? So basically, so let's let put it simple. Uh, a booster, when you call it a booster, is because if you have taken one particular vaccine, uh, it stimulates a particular set of immunity, a particular set of antibodies against what is being given in the vaccine. When you boost, when you say booster, you are giving the same vaccine again, so that you have more antibodies like the ones you had before. That is called a booster. Now, the idea of, because each the vaccine is different. Now, the Covaxin is made in a different format because there you have the whole virus. The COVID shield is a different uh, type of vaccine where you are giving only one particle of the virus. You're not giving the whole virus at all. So the, each will have the antibodies produced against different things. So you're not actually boosting when you combine, mix and match and give them. Now, what happens is many of those tests that have been done, research have been done. The first dose and the second dose, there are a lot of research that were done where they try to mix and match vaccines because of lack of availability of a particular vaccine that was taken. In. And those studies have shown that when you mix vaccines, you get a better response. But uh, the biggest problem is for a booster, those kind of studies are very less, very minimal. So if you make, what happens if you mix a different vaccine for a booster, we don't have studies. The one evidence that says the booster works actually is from the US, the Pfizer vaccine, where all three doses were from Pfizer vaccine. That's why they said that even works for Omicron. So that is why booster should be taken. Even for Covishield, there is a study from the Oxford, that is one who guys who did that, who made the vaccine. They also said that when you take the third dose as the same vaccine, there is an effect where it can decrease your severity with Omicron. So in that sense, at this point, we don't have an evidence. That is why the government is also not telling you to take a mix and match of vaccine, but telling you to take a booster specifically for the same sort of vaccine. Even the doctors are taking the same sort of a vaccine. Uh, what you have taken earlier, all those now the government is giving is also the same vaccine. That is, as far as the evidence today is concerned, maybe tomorrow it may change and they do a large scale study where they mix and match. But at this point of time, yes, stick to the same vaccine that you have taken. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much because many of us have this all uh, cocktail uh, ideas in our mind. So this is clear. Thank you. Uh, the other question is uh, uh, related to dentists. The question is, how much risk is there for dentists if they want to practice their profession and any specific precautions? I'm sure that there's somebody dentist in the family and Sheikh Mohammed is concerned about the person. Definitely they are at higher risk because they directly deal with the respiratory yeah. tract and oral tract. So usually that is where sometimes something like a rapid antigen test may be beneficial. So somebody, if there is a patient uh, who's coming to them, they can do a rapid antigen test and then if it is negative, they may if the patient is asymptomatic, if the patient is symptomatic, definitely don't enter procedures at that point of time. But if the patient is asymptomatic, let's say, who walks into a dental OPD, uh, if you can do a rapid antigen on your, on your patient and then if it is negative, maybe it is uh, safer. But then again, dentist himself should wear all the protective equipment. He should be using an N95 at least because most of their uh, instruments, they are vibrators, they are, uh, they are you know, uh, their chisels, they have these kind of grinders and stuff. So where the virus kind of goes out in the smoke and, and they can get infected even with the smaller particles. So we call aerosolization. 
which is higher in dental procedures. So it is important for the dentist, irrespective of whether the patient is positive, negative, rat negative, uh, they have to follow a strict sort of personal protection. In the sense, they will have to wear N95 at least as a minimum, and then face masks and whatever PPE they might be wearing. So that is important for the dentist because they're at higher uh, chance of getting infected. I, I hear from some people that we should be wearing two masks. See, when you're talking about cloth mask, they say two masks or two layers. What the simple surgical mask that usually when you see doctors wearing uh, on the hospital, and they are three ply masks. They're actually three layered masks. That is what it's called, three layer mask or three ply. So it's, it's actually already multi-layered masks. There are some situations where the chances of uh, exposure is higher for some subset of patients, some subset of doctors like dentists we're talking about, where the chances of them getting infection is higher. In that sense, uh, we suggest them to wear N95 kind of mask. Thank you. Um, Dipti has a peculiar question. She says, what about COVID-19 affected during menses for women? Is there any side effect in the woman due to this? Any specific no, nothing uh, studied so far in that angle. You may have a backache, which will be more pronounced. You may have leg pain, weakness, that's it. Nothing else. I think symptoms might be exaggerated and you are not confused about what is it. But long term or short term, I don't think there's any other problem with that. Just like any fever else, other fever that you get during that period. Thank you. That's very reassuring. Amrita has a question about uh, it's just curiosity, I guess. Do we need to wait for nine months for booster dose after taking second vaccine? Many, of, See, many have finished uh, booster dose, as for me. <laughs> no, <laughs> See, uh, ideally, uh, the minimum time for majority, when you test for majority of them, that is that uh, the vaccine will give you some sort of an immunity up to nine months at least. That is what the um, studies have said from major vaccines that have been tested. And it's just not about the antibody production. There is something called a memory immunity within the body. There are something called T cells and memory cells. These are cells that that store the information. So it's like a, you have a RAM and you have a ROM. So this information is stored in the ROM of uh, the body. You're talking so, in our language. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, is, that is to make things easier. So you, you have a ROM. So the memory is there in the ROM. So you may not have all the information in the RAM. The RAM may not be there, but it's in the ROM. So yeah, when uh, up to nine months, I think uh, that's what majority of the time it's up to nine months at least. Then it may be there for beyond for some people. It may be shortened for some people. So it depends on them. Um, th there is a question about, um, uh, we see lots of people who are worried when kids test positive. Is this worry misplaced? Aren't the risks the same for kids and adults? Like mm. so, uh, adult getting infected versus a child getting infected, is it the risk is the, on the similar proportion of a child it's higher? And I'm assuming that uh, there is, a, uh, there is a, also a, a perspective about uh, adults are typically vaccinated right now and children are not. So, so, Dr. Anjul, uh, yeah. you are the best. So, person. for the kids, definitely, um, if you take out the category of the kids who have a risk factor, as we have said, uh, talking before as well about obesity, the children with any heart disease, underlying heart disease, lung disease, liver or kidney disease, or the children who are on steroids for any other reason like nephrotic syndrome or autoimmune disease. So those are the kids who are on a high risk category and they tend to become sicker if they get uh, uh, this COVID infection, either Omicron or any other variant. But if the children are not in this high risk category, they tend to not develop very severe diseases. That's what we have seen up till now in the first and second wave. And hopefully uh, as the spread has started in the third wave, the third wave also is not going to be any different. So yes, the we should be worried for any family member getting the, uh, affected with COVID. It is going to, same, going to be same for the uh, children as well. Uh, only thing is, smaller the children, uh, isolation becomes difficult. For an adult, you can tell them to stay in the room alone, but the kids it become difficult. So one of the parents have to stay with the kids if they're smaller kids. Yeah, they have to wear their mask all the time, the parent. 
whoever is taking care of the child and uh, otherwise uh, symptomatic treatment and their disease uh, per se is little less severe as compared to the adults that is true in case if they don't have any risk factors but monitoring them keeping a watch on them how, how their fever is doing how their cold and cough is doing they are not developing any breathlessness is very important so um, when you say watching over now see in the second wave we always had that oximeter right that was the key thing that keep an eye on the oxygen um in this wave i don't hear that it's more about yeah. like you know cough and fever so uh, what do you mean now is there right. a difference or there is what do we check what do we keep our eyes on see this uh, this way we are not seeing so much of oxygen requirement or oxygen depth in the children and in the uh, any of the population adult as compared to the uh, the second wave so probably that's why the uh, people are not thinking about the pulse oximeters as such uh, uh, when i say monitoring the monitoring is for the symptoms usually the milder disease uh, we expect the timeline of 72 hours when the fever subsides usually that is the time when the headache and the body pain comes down cough and cold comes down by 4 to 5 days if this timelines are not been met or the child develops a severe symptoms child or adult like breathlessness or difficulty in breathing or a very severe cough or the fever which is not coming down in spite of using the fever medications so or they are developing any other symptoms like severe lethargy not able to eat passing less urine uh, 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 they are either becoming very sleepy or not able to sleep at all so these are the symptoms which tells us that there is something else which is going on and remember every disease there is not only uh, covid there can be other non covid disease which might be equally important and has to be checked what happens is people check rapid antigen test and they say we are covid positive and they stay at home thinking this is covid and it might be a secondary infection which might be coming over the covid so in case if your timeline of the symptoms is not tallying with the milder disease uh, as, as i told you up till now so those are the cases which they should go to the healthcare provider and get them done checked this is um, extremely important because it is very different from what we had heard in the wave 2 and you're telling me that we should take care of uh, the vitals and just look at the symptom and understand whether the symptoms are worsening and also the timeline is managed or not because you're supposed to start getting better after fourth day fifth day everything should reduce the fever the body aches the cough should reduce and if it's not getting reduced we should be alert and go to the healthcare provider right yeah. uh, did and i get it right lanley will be lanley will be able to uh, uh, put a light on the edel so the, uh, the basically the point uh, at this point of time is that if somebody doesn't have symptoms subsiding by day 5 they should approach their doctor whether it's a kid or an adult because you may be dealing with covid you may be dealing with something else so uh, up to day 5 majority of the symptoms are coming down with omicron if they are going up if the fever is persisting 103 and like and if you have cough or new symptoms or your symptoms are worsening definitely it is time to reach out to the doctor otherwise majority of the time what we are seeing now even with delta or with omicron now is that majority of the time the symptoms are milder in the sense my symptoms may be excruciating you may have a severe headache you may have a severe fever for one spike or two spikes you may have a severe back ache and body ache but these are not translating to a more severe disease form later on so up to 3 to 5 days if the symptoms are settled then it should be okay if you have to remember that the oxygen problem starts after day 8 day 7 day 8 even in the uh, even in the routine covid in the first wave or second wave so you may not require the oxygen saturation on day 1 day 2 it will be normal it starts to drop only after day 6 and day 7 so if you are still having symptoms fever after day 5 then it is important for that you follow up with the doctor so that is when you need more monitoring more uh, looking out for but if it's settling down within day 3 to day 5 then there's nothing much to worry about thank you so much this is very very important information i'm moving on to the next question which is coming from srinivas rao and i i think this is so uh, one of the things which is on top of our mind that you know once we got infected with covid recovered now we worried that what is happening beyond covid is there some side effect that i have in my body and so what kind of health checkups we do what what kind of uh, precautions we take to be sure that there's nothing we are missing out and there's not something suddenly will pop up as you know oh i didn't realize that covid left some problem in my body 
I think Nalini will be the best person to answer because myself and Pawan, we both look after the intensive care. So, so the basic problem in um, this situation is that uh, some patients uh, are developing diabetes. Maybe there was in pre-diabetic phase, it's coming out to the fore after 30 days. That's one new study that was also coming up. 30 days beyond, you may have diabetes, uh, which might be which might be more uh, visible now because you're checking for them, you're looking for them. So many of Indians are diabetics, which we, they don't know it because they may have a high insulin resistance. They may not know that they're diabetic. We see that majority of those times of patients who land up in the ICU, when you test them, they're detected to be diabetic. Because usually 32 years, 30 years to 40 years, guys, they never go around for a health checkup. They don't check their sugars or blood pressure normally. Because these guys are coming to the hospitals, we are able to pick up more and more of these lifestyle diseases. And it doesn't mean that COVID has caused diabetes or COVID has caused hypertension. This is basically that they're underlying, that are coming to the fore because they are approaching to the doctor at that point of time. So it is always, always important to keep oneself uh, not too worried about what is going to come, whether will I have a problem, whether I will have a new problem that comes up because of COVID. Uh, it's basically you need to understand what is happening with you. And like uh, we normally prescribe anybody about 35 uh, females go for these particular tests. Anybody uh, about 35 males, especially if they do a sedentary lifestyle, they are working on in front of the computer in a software provision. We expect them to go and check for hypertension, diabetes, and other things, lifestyle diseases, because uh, they spend a lot of time sedentary. So that is the reason that you basically precaution prevention is better than cure. Rather than finding out what is the problem, uh, probably lead a healthy lifestyle. That is what good sleep, get your stress down, more exercise, more activity. Those are the more important things rather than getting worried because it only adds up your anxiety about things to start thinking about what's going to happen. I've had COVID. Will I develop something because of COVID? A lot of people keep, seem to be asking this question. It is just because more amount of people are coming. Uh, to the hospital or visiting the doctor during COVID time, the youngsters especially, you are picking up the lifestyle early there, which you would not have known until unless it brews up to be a little more severe form. Um, I think Yassin's question also is uh, respond, uh, answered here uh, about the other long-term side effects of corona can cause. I think you already answered that. Dr. Nalini, do you want to add anything to this about side effects of corona should we be aware of? So after first and second waves, uh, so as Dr. Pawan said, yes, incidental detection of uh, problems which were just developing became more obvious. That was one thing. In fact, we had in smokers, we have detected some lung cancers when CT scan was done for COVID. Like there's so many incidental new things have come up. Tuberculosis was diagnosed, lung cancer was diagnosed. Other than that COVID per se, so uh, we had a lot of long COVID symptoms after first and second waves, significant long COVID symptoms like fatigue for a very, very long time. And uh, with little walking and all that, people developing sweating, palpitations and all that, post-viral uh, um, uh, symptoms. So it is very, very important for these people when they have these symptoms not to do rigorous exercise because in the anxiety to get back to fitness, Many people have done cycling, immediate post-viral period, and gymming, Jumba classes, and all these things. And some of them have come with, you know, heart attacks and all these things also. And sometimes post-viral, the heart also is very weak, and they can get developed into cardiac complications. So it is very, very important to take it easy one to two months, at least for one month after a significant viral infection. That's what we had observed. Some people developed some neuro some people post COVID developed some clots in the brains, clots in the heart blood vessels. And uh, some people uh, complained of insomnia. That was another important uh, problem that we faced. Many people complained of difficulty sleeping, brain fogging, all these things. Uh, now it would be interesting to know whether it will be the same or not with Omicron. I hope it should not be because it is a milder version. So another, yes, it is just not that we get the infection, but how long I have seen my own colleagues and patients suffering for months together after COVID with some non-specific symptoms. That, um, there is, COVID is over, everybody thinks we should get back to normalcy, but for that person to work and to manage the house, particularly a woman, and to cope up with all these post-COVID fatigue is very difficult. So particularly for COVID, if I can avoid it, I will be happy, it is, even if it is a milder version. Great. Thank you so much. 
I have some uh, yes no kind of questions. Just we are running out of time, so wanted to be brief on this. Uh, uh, are um, cloth mask uh, good enough to protect ourselves, or we must use N95? For Omicron, no. Not we N95. Don't don't don't, don't run behind N95. Simple surgical masks. Simple mask. surgical mask, cloth mask, multi three layer masks of cloth is mask, Surgical mask. And if you're using N95, how many days can you use one N95? See, you have to understand N95 is for a self, it's for healthcare person. It is not for regular use. And because an N95 has got a lot of things to be looked into, it should fit the face properly and other things. Um, this is that is a problem. You will use it for multiple days, and then the idea is that there is virus on the outside. So if you are taking it out, touching it, uh, there's no point in actually wearing a mask. And N95 is harder to breathe through. So you will not comply with using the mask all the time. You're half the time, half the time it is down because it is tough to breathe through. So why do you want to subject yourself with very negative? And can we sanitize mask with sanitizer? This is like first time ever question which I have. Can we sanitize mask with sanitizer? Oh. No, I no. Guess if your mask is uh, 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 this thing, then throw it and uh, have another one. And I think answering the previous question, N95 again is a single use mask. If you're wearing it uh, once uh, 24 hours, then you should discard it and uh, wear another one later. You should not be reusing that as well. Okay, now this is a very unique question which is coming from um, Vyasa. My parents have taken two doses of Pfizer vaccine in USA. Now they're back in India and we don't have the Pfizer precautionary dose or the booster dose. In that case, can my parents take either Covishield or Covix, uh, Covaxin as precautionary dose? Yes, whatever is available. Okay, take whatever is available. Good. Um, any chances of vital parts are infected after suffering mild, or, uh, mild to severe Delta variant after six to eight months? I think this is answered by Dr. Mandalini already. So we will skip this. Um, then the Kartika Nair has, doctors have been seeing a lot of heart-related issue in people with the age group between 30 to 45. Unsure if this is related to COVID, uh, but this is definitely something that has been seen in lot in the last two years. Any comments on this? More anxiety, more stress, more uh, worrying, more reading on the Google and WhatsApp. Uh, that is causing a problem. See, these are there, but it never used to be reported in the media because uh, the doctors, we used to see them. Uh, more amount of patients are coming in because they are being detected early. That is one reason. But yes, definitely COVID-related, like you said, there are a few cases where COVID can cause, like you said, myocarditis and other things are there. But it is not uh, increased in the incidence. But what we are doing is we are picking up them early because uh, most of these people are coming and looking for their health, checking their health, and they're coming back. Because they had COVID, they came to the hospital. And then they're in the follow-up, then they suddenly pick up something which is which wouldn't have been picked up. So the number of picking up is little on the highest. A uh, question from Teresa, which is a little uh, difficult to understand, but I'm trying to understand it and ask it in a sim uh, simpler way, that um, uh, Teresa is vaccinated and uh, or somebody is vaccinated, has diabetes, what will be the effect of COVID? So the idea of vaccination is to prevent severe disease. It is good whether you are a diabetic, non-diabetic, hypertensive, or whatsoever. The idea is to prevent a serious infection. It doesn't mean that a vaccinated person will never get admitted. It is 100% effective in preventing admissions. No, it is not. At the same time, um, it, it kind of reduces your chances of getting into a hospital that way. So in that sense, yes, it is uh, beneficial. Everybody get, should get vaccinated, whoever it is eligible for. Uh, I would like to add here, Manisha, that um, to that question, double vaccinated diabetes. Now, um, if, with that also, she is at risk for developing COVID. And with diabetes, yes, they, sometimes there can be increased uh, risk of severe disease. Because I will give you one example where one of my colleagues, double vaccinated, about 42 years, thinking that mask will give very good protection, N95, went to a New, a New Year's party and then spent dancing and wearing, but he was the only one wearing mask in that whole crowd of 100 people. And he was the one who got the COVID now. He's recently, he's presently suffering from COVID. So mask does not give 100% protection. They should be COVID appropriate behavior, no gatherings in a closed space. 
and um, vaccination also very clearly data shows that after six months efficacy uh, in reducing hospitalization reduces unless a booster is taken so in india present vaccination rate as of today is 65 percent double vaccination many have, most have not received booster so we have to be careful particularly people with health problems like diabetes as i told vaccination masking distancing no gatherings all together will work yes very very clear thank you now this is a question which is coming from um, from sumit chaudhary who says both my parents aged over 70 years tested positive five days back their fever has subsided today but they have nose and throat congestion cough and fatigue what do they need to do that is like steaming gargling nasal drops etc going ahead for the next 7 to 8 days to recover completely and just take precaution beyond that in we should not take personal uh, medical advice here that would not be right also and safe for them let us take general questions rather than a particular case example of our patient yeah so uh, sumit uh, this i translate to you as please take medical advice because we may not have enough information to advise on specific case so um, the I, i'll uh, i'll take a, we are at 525 so i'll move on to the last question uh which is uh, which is very interesting where uh, where the person says that you know what everything is uh, everybody is saying that this is the last wave or this is like you know after all the variations various various we saw delta and we saw now talking about omicron is this the end of covid uh difficult to answer that question but see what happens for any virus any virus to be effective basically the virus doesn't want to kill the person or the host in which it is there the idea of a virus is to silently spread from one person to other very effectively actually it is doing the best right this point of time with the omicron it is spreading fast it is not causing a lot of harm to the host in that way it is replicating and then moving that is where its virus is at pinnacle peak now so will it Um, but every virus will change some mutations will happen so how will it will further go on will it become more milder and more milder or will it get a little bit severe we don't know because it is getting infecting a lot of people and it is infecting all the population different sorts of population with globalization we are seeing it is uh, caucasians latinos americans uh, i mean chinese people indian people different genetic structure each person has different genetic structure and there is a lot of genetic exchange that happens when this virus kind of uh, mutates and replicates and stuff like that so in that sense we don't know for sure now none of you have to remember that none of the astrologers could predict this waves and same way none of the scientific people can also predict what will happen tomorrow and the day after but then right. definitely uh, this, yeah so and i think we'll add one more thing here that uh, uh, omicron or uh, covid doesn't read the whatsapp so it doesn't know that it has to end after this <laughs> that, that's one thing we should always keep in mind that it can't read social media it can't read whatsapp uh, you uh, just wanted to add one point uh, sorry nali i just wanted to add one point before we end since there are a lot of people here is that to remember we are talking to a, a lot about the covid vaccination this is specifically for the children the, for the parents to remember that just because covid is there the rest of the diseases have not vanished so it's very important that they should go ahead and take their vaccination for the children the other mandatory vaccines which are there don't delay them just because the wave is there just wanted to make that point because we are seeing a lot of default in the vaccination sorry nalli you wanted to you were making some point yeah usually the age of any pandemic is around two and a half three years that's what happened with spanish flu also so you are almost there and uh, provided corona doesn't surprise us more it might become endemic if not uh, you know uh, seasonal for some time and then it might become seasonal like flu so i think we are almost out of it we have to understand that uh, at the time of spanish flu we didn't have so much of globalization people were not jetting from siberia to antarctica so this is a lot of globalization and people roam from here and there across the world so there is a lot of uh, problem in that so yeah finally i think the end point should be that people should understand it what will happen tomorrow we don't know where we are going to we don't know but at this point of time uh, mask up stay safe and don't be worried not to be in a panic saying that yeah this has become 
a little more milder and everybody is going to get it so don't rush and then jump and suddenly you get covid and don't uh, become really jittery about it because majority of the population will get this time around and majority of them are not going to have a severe disease it's only a few of them uh, who will need some precautions more precautions and some of them who will need medical care they will definitely need medical care and they should not ignore it since thinking that it is a milder form so yes definitely you have to be cautious but at the same time it's not the end of the world it's not don't panic about it uh, it's think of it like yes we are we have to go through this we will get it majority of us are going to get it there is no out of it situation at this point of time but let's try to avoid getting it just because you are going to get it doesn't mean that everybody should go and get it and land up in the hospitals and overwhelm in the systems so it's basically that try to avoid getting it as much as you can maybe who knows next time when you get it is even milder thank you thank you dr nalini dr anjul and dr pawan this was one of the most uh, uh, informative and uh, relevant conversation that i have had on omicron specially with the new new information and new whatsapp messages that we are getting it is very very uh, critical that hcia brings the knowledge and expert knowledge to the member organization employees and the it employees because so many of us have these questions and don't really know who to go to to get the expert opinion thank you so much at the more than 300 people attended the session and i'm pretty sure that it's just the login but ultimate benefit is for multiplication of this because lots of family friends and relatives and neighbors will have this discussion and now they will be able to refer to the nuggets of caution and wisdom that you have shared today thank you so much stay safe and i hope you follow the things that you will heard today thank you thank you, thank you.